Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute here. All right, we're gonna get started. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Lori Lilly and I'm the founder and executive director of Howard EcoWorks, as well as your host for our webinar, Reducing Stormwater Runoff with Biochar Addition to Soils in Ellicott City, Maryland, with our guest speakers, Durya Akpinar and Srabhoni Chowdhury. For this afternoon's webinar, please log your questions in the Q&A box as opposed to the chat box to make them more visible to us, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation. We will be recording this webinar and posting it to our website, YouTube channel, and Facebook page, so you can keep a look out there if you want to revisit uh, this information. Just to briefly introduce you to our organization, Howard EcoWorks' mission is to empower communities and diverse workforces to respect and restore our natural systems for future generations. So we have a dual mission of both workforce development and environmental improvements. The services that we offer largely revolve around designing, building, and maintaining various types of environmental projects with our uplift and ready program crews. We also run a program called Seeds of Change out of our local detention center where we operate a native plant nursery. In our programs, we're looking to marry environmental restoration with the social benefits of workforce training for the environmental industry. In this time of the coronavirus, we believe that it is, it is even more meaningful to explore and advocate for green jobs. We can provide work opportunities that lend themselves much more readily to social distancing by being outside in fresh air. To that end, for our friends that are out there in the Baltimore, Washington region, we're offering a paid 30 hour training opportunity called Gateway to Green Jobs from November 30th to December 4th for individuals displaced from their jobs due to the coronavirus. This is a great chance to explore meaningful work opportunities in the environmental field and individuals will leave the training with exposure to the industry and a wide variety of employers, plus a sustainable landscaping certificate. Applications are due by November 17th and can be found on our website. So moving on to our topic of biochar, our primary reason for looking into biochar as an environmental solution stems from our involvement in Ellicott City, Maryland as well as my professional and volunteer roles in flood mitigation and watershed management in this watershed since 2011. Ellicott City is a historic mill town in Maryland that has a history of flooding, including multiple high intensity and very destructive flood events in 2011, 2016, and 2018. Currently, there is a flood mitigation plan in place that is based on a hydraulic and hydrologic model developed by McCormick Taylor. The proposed solutions are very large infrastructure projects that will take a long time to implement and are extremely expensive. While these larger projects are being planned, designed, and permitted, we have an opportunity to both explore and implement other less costly alternatives that will mitigate smaller volumes of water while educating and engaging the community. With our project and work, we wanna target the pervious surfaces for projects because in this relatively small watershed, we have around 800 acres of turf grass that is acting in a similar way as concrete in terms of runoff because of compacted subsoils 
and the shallow root systems of turf grass that is the dominant cover. Our two-year Ellicott City Soak It Up project was funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and aimed to engage the private residential sector in the watershed in stormwater solutions to convert grass to more permeable landscapes such as rain gardens, tree plantings, and conservation landscapes. Based on the research that we saw coming out of the University of Delaware, we also wanted to assess the potential benefits and opportunities of using biochar soil amendment to reduce runoff in the watershed. The value that we see in this practice is multifold and that we can achieve several environmental objectives with a non-structural practice that improves water quality, reduces stormwater runoff, sequesters carbon in the ground, has more longevity and leaches less nutrients than compost, and repurposes organic woody material that would otherwise end up in the landfill. So with that, we are excited to have the University of Delaware present the results of their research project here today. And I'd like to introduce our speakers. Durya Akpinar received a double bachelor's degree in environmental engineering in 2009 and a chemical engineering degree in 2010 from Ataturk University, Turkey. After her graduation, Durya worked as an engineer at the Institute of Sugar Process in Ankara, Turkey for one year. She received her master's degree in environmental engineering from Ataturk University in 2014 with th three years of teaching assistance, assistant experience. Durya is now a PhD student in water resource engineering at the University of Delaware, and her research focuses on understanding biochar's impact on plant growth, nutrient removal, and hydrology and bioretention systems. Sraboni Chowdhury received a BS in civil engineering with a concentration in environmental engineering from the Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology in 2017. Following graduation, Sraboni spent one year as a lecturer in the Department of Civil Engineering at Presidency University in Dhaka, Bangladesh, before starting her graduate studies at the University of Delaware in February 2019. Sorboni is a student in the master's program in environmental engineering, and her research focuses on understanding the mechanisms by which biochar enhances soil aggregation and stormwater infiltration when amended to soil. Both Duria and Sorboni have been doing their research projects under Dr. Paul Imhoff, who is also here with us today, if we need him in the question answer period. And with that, I'm gonna hand the slide presentation over to Duria. If you could turn on your microphone and video. Thank you very much, Laurie, for the nice introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Before I start, I would like to thank you all for joining the MEP webinar today. We are very really delighted to share our recent research findings on runoff reduction using biochar as a soil amendment in Ellicott City, Maryland. We tested potential of biochar in reducing runoff reduction in Ellicott City. As you know, Ellicott City has endured two deadly flus in the last five years and controlling or reducing the runoff volume is vital in this area. Recently, biochar has received increasing attention in stormwater management because of its potential ability of soaking up the water. Therefore, uh, biochar is the sustainable uh, print material that we think may be helpful to achieve controlling the fluids, fluids by reducing the stormwater volume. This project was funded uh, by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Excuse me, Daria, do you want to be showing your slides now? Oh, you, I share it, don't you see it? No, I don't see your slides. Here we go. Okay, we see them now. Okay. Thank you. So um, recently, biochar has received increasing attention in stormwater management uh, because of uh, its potential ability of soaking up the water. Therefore, uh, biochar is the sustainable friendly material that we think may be helpful uh, to achieve controlling the fluids by reducing the stormwater volume. This project was funded by uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. 
Uh, before I start my uh, presentation, uh, I want to give a brief outline for all the presentation. We will start with the talking about the basics of biochar, and then we will be following biochar impact on soil hydrology. And then I will share uh, the field work in an eloquent city that we are testing and then getting the results. We will follow up measurement and then monitoring, and Straboni will co uh, continue for the results and con conclusion part. Um, so the question is, what is biochar? So biochar is a, a green charcoal, high organic carbon, and largely resistant to decomposition. Uh, biochar can be produced from large range of plant and waste uh, feedstock. It can be produced from manure or sludge or full leaves from your backyard. Well said biochar can be defined as charcoal made from plant material or waste in high temperature ovens or with limited oxygen. So how can we produce biochar? So biochar is a thermal uh, decomposition product from biomass heated at relatively low temperature with limited oxygen. The most common manufactured way to produce biochar is the pyrolysis. So what is pyrolysis? Well, pyrolysis is the thermal degradation of biomass in the absence or limited concentration of oxygen to produce condensable vapor, vapor, gases, and charcoal. There is no emission released. This process is different than combustion. So combustion is the reaction uh, of a material in the presence of heat and air or oxygen leading to complete oxidation. The emission released during the combustion. This is the big uh, differences between uh, pyrolysis and then combustion pro uh, process. So why biochar um, is getting known as an effective soil amendment product? So uh, biochar has low, large uh, pore volume with high porosity. If we uh, look at the biochar particle, particle closely, you can see that biochar has significant intropores that makes it hold and retain more water. Since biochar has high surface area uh, with the high uh, ionic charge, it attracts water and then keep it into the intropore. Therefore, biochar included soil capture uh, the high volume of the first flush or runoff, which reduced the possibility of flood. And overall, it holds an infiltration, more water with the increased infiltration capacity. Similarly, uh, increased water retention capacity of the soil will improve plant available water, thus helps plant to survive uh, more particularly drought session. Also, increased retention time helps uh, pollution stay more in soil by increasing res residence time of the nitrogen compound, as well as uh, improves microbial community, particularly denitrifying bacteria, and enhanced denitrification with the less nitrogen discharge to the groundwater. So in order to quantify the impact of biochar amendment to soil on stormwater infiltration in Howard County, we selected two test sites where uh, soils represent the dominant soil texture in Tiber Hudson watershed. These test, site, test sites are located in Ellicott City. Third site is located adjacent to the parking lot at St. Peter's uh, Episcopal Church, which is called a church site during the presentation. Second site is located adjacent to the parking lot of Slack Funeral Home, which is called a Slack site. To determine the soil particle size distribution, we conduct a uh, dry sieving and hydrometer test. Based on the fraction of sand, uh, seal, and clay, the USDA soil texture for the church site was identified as a loam, whereas the slack site, uh, the soil texture was identified as a loam with a high percentage of uh, gravel. So for the biochar implementation in a field site, uh, this image here shows the plan view of a biochar amended and amended section at each test site. Site by site section, which is five by five feet of teal soil and biochar amended soil were constructed at each test site. Based on the area of the parking lot, church site receives runoff about 25 meters square of impervious area, while a select site receives a stormwater runoff from 120 meters square of impervious area. Um, in March, uh, for the field size application, in March uh, 2019, we incorporated the biochar in 5x5 feet test section to a 
step of one foot at each test section. We use commercial biochar that we purchased from Oregon company. Biochar we use this project was made from tops and limbs of Douglas fir and then Pandora's pine pyrolyzed at about 950 Celsius degree at high heating rate. For the biochar amendment, the top one each of the soil that contains plant matter and then grass roots were removed. Then the remaining soil up to 12 inches was tilled and then mixed combining amended and amended section to make the homogeneous soil mix uh, for the entire test region. We calculated how much soil needed to be removed in amended section based on the bulk density of the soil. Then we removed the soil, which is equal to 4% by mass, uh, biochar mass from the amended section with the replacement with the 4% biochar mass. Then uh, biochar was added with shovels and a bucket and a mix with a mechanical tiller up to 12 inch step. This step were repeated for each test site and completed in two to three days. Following uh, the biochar addition to the amended section, um, both sections were seeded with uh, tall fisky grass and uh, stabilized with straw. Uh, in the light of the construction experience and desirable biochar amendment results in this project in Ellicott City, we incorporated biochar to the new sites located in existing highway greenway. These areas are usually not counted for the treatment and unfortunately uh, they have little infiltration rates since soil are highly compacted. Therefore, it is necessary, therefore it's necessary to modify the infiltration rate and the pollutant removal capacity in order to increase quantity and quality of the stormwater discharge. Biochar may increase stormwater infiltration of low infiltrating roadway soils sufficiently to convert these soils into the stormwater treatment system. We installed biochar to the Greenway at two existing highway under the authority of Maryland Transportation in August 2020. And similarly, we constructed biochar at two roadway sites under the authorization of Delaware Department of Transportation in October 2020. Uh, in this uh, large biochar installation, sites were divided into three identical sections with a dim dimension of six by uh, 20 feet, including 4% by mass biochar amended, 2% by mass uh, biochar amended, and 0% by mass biochar amended and but still section. This section uh, received the storm water from the highway road. Since the application area of these new sites are very large, we developed new technique for mixing biochar into the soil uh, with the minimal dis disturbance in the large scale application. Thanks to Chuck Herbert, uh, Hegberg and then Dan Kramer in Infinite Solution Company, we installed biochar mechanically using the Harrow tiller. Okay. Uh, based on the new developed installation technique, topsoil of the sites containing grass and plant roots was removed using the skid loader. Once this material was removed, a harrow tiller was used to till and then mix the soil throughout the test section to 12 inches step. This unique tiller attached to the standard skid loader and is able to mix the soil uniformly over the top 12 inches soil depth. Next, for the biochar amended section, biochar was added by holding up the large superset, as you can see in the photo, and then till using the same, same harrow tiller. After the completion of the biochar installation, sites uh, were seeded with accept, uh, acceptable seed mix uh, by MDTA and then Delta, and stabilized uh, using the biodegradable uh, straw mat or blanket. So to test the biochar impact um, on infiltration capacity in test sites in Ellicott City, uh, periodic field testing uh, was conducted over one and a half years after the biochar installation to the sites. Field saturated hydraulic conductivity was measured using modified um, uh, Philippe Dune uh, MPD infiltrometer at multiple sampling points at each test section. Basically, MPD was inserted about five centimeter into the surface of the soil and then fill up to 30 centimeter of water. Then a uh, change in the water level in the cylinder was measured over time and recording electronically. In addition to that, uh, soil samples were taken by intake coring uh, for the laboratory measurement. These samples were used uh, for the initial soil characterization and then a field bulk density measurement for biochar construction. 
water holding capacity and soil retention parameters and following analysis to understand uh, the mechanism by which biochar enhanced uh, were conducted by using uh, the soil sampling after the last field measurement. So for the results of the analysis and uh, the measurement part, my colleague Sraban will continue her presentation to share our results. Thank you, Daria, and hi, everyone. I'll be covering more detail on the measurements and monitoring and results and conclusion sections. So as Daria mentioned, we have been, uh, we did use the modified Philip Dion infiltrometer, as we can see in the in this first picture. So if I, I would like to uh, briefly mention what we do, like with the time domain reflectometer, at first we take the initial volumetric water content of the soil, then we install the MPT with around three and a half liter of water into it and wait until all the water goes down. The changes in water head in the cylinder, we record it, uh, it's automatically being recorded in this table, the, the change in head versus time from which we can later calculate the fuel saturated hydraulic conductivity with also with the measuring the final volumetric water content. In such a way, we perform periodic measurement of saturated hydraulic conductivity in early September and mid November of 2019 and then late July of 2020. And after our last set of measurements, we collected soil core samples from the field to run laboratory experiments to investigate more into the mechanism, how biochar affects the case site in the field. So what happened after the first five months of biochar installation? So this graph is showing the visually representing the case set a special variability in the site. The horizontal distance here indicates the length of the treatment section parallel to the parking lot from which the site is receiving the runoff. The vertical distance here indicates the width of our treatment section perpendicular to the parking lot. So as you can see, like for the amend, vulture amended section, the, the, the Solid inner cycles represents the sampling points of our MPD, which is like 10 centimeter in diameter. And then this uh, um, the outer dash line cycles represents the zone of measurement influence, which is around 20 centimeter. So in the amended section for the, for the slack side, we could perform 10 MPD measurements for the amended section and then eight for the unamended section. And we noticed, uh, noticed that for the unamended section, which has uh, more blue, blue color regions, indicating that the case height is very low, like less than 10 centimeter per hour in this unamended section. Whereas for the amended section, we see that most of this voucher amended region has lighter color, indicating the case height value is greater than 50 centimeter per hour. So after five months of biochar amendment in the slack side, we noticed that uh, 6.4 times higher case site is can we get from the in the biochar amended soil for the slack side. Now moving to the charge side. So in the charge side, we had very uh, few, we had like fewer sampling points compared to the slack side. So if we take a look on the soil texture, the slag side is low with a, like 20 to 25% of gravel content for which the slag side has much higher case head, uh, case head for the native soil. But in the charge side, the soil is loamy soil with very low infiltration rate. And with one set of MPD, it took around six to seven hours to complete one set of measurements. So we had like six MPD and it, it took around two to three days of 12 hours of measurement to complete the to, uh, complete 12 measurements, six, uh, five to on average five to six measurements in each of the treatment section for the charge site because of its low, in, very slow infiltration rate. So what we see like at, after five months of biochar amendment in the September in an amended section, 
mostly they uh, mostly they have like blue region indicating that the case set is mostly uh, less than two centimeter per hour. Whereas for the amended vulture well, amended region, we see like the most of the, the area has like greenish color representing the case set is four to six centimeter per hour for most part of the biochar amended region. So after five months of biochar amendment, we found like for the charge site, 1.8 times higher case set we can observe in the biochar amended soil. Now, how the mean geometric mean case set changes through time? So we sample for three times, like September 2019, November 2019, and July 2019. And then we found like for the slack site, initially there was like 6.4 times higher mean case set in the biochar amended soil, show, uh, representing here as a dark green bar compared to the unamended section. Then in the November, the case set decreased for both of these regions and still there was like 2.3 times higher case set in the biochar amended soil compared to the unamended soil. And then in the last set of measurements after 1.2 years of monitoring, the, the case set decreased to a lot with a mean of 0.8 centimeter per hour in the unamended section, whereas in the amended section, it was still 13 times higher case set uh, with a mean case set of 10.7 centimeter per hour. So on average in the slack side with low meat texture and gravel content, we found like 7.3 times higher case set uh, observed for the amended soil. Now moving to the charge side, for both September and November period, we found like for the biochar amended region, there was on average two times higher case set we observed, but during our last set of measurements, which is on July 2020, we observed that the biochar um, amended section has lower case set compared to the unamended section and was wondering why it happened during the summertime measurements. So if we take a look on the location of this unamended section and amended section, we can see that the unamended section has uh, is located near a large big tree receiving more shares and less of sunlight in this charge site, whereas the amended section is located farther, the farther right from the tree shares and receiving more sunlight. And we could also notice like that the plant species was different in both of these sections. So during this summertime measurement, if we take a closer look, we found that in unamended section, the vegetation density was uh, vegetation density or plant cover was much higher compared to the amended section. And also we noticed differences in plant species in both of these sections. So then we tried to quantify or estimate the different plant species for which we used a quadrant method with a one feet square wooden frame to take the images of the plant species in, of one square within one square feet area, and then it divided into 10 by 10 grid to estimate the percentage of different plant species. And found that in the unamended section, there was 54% of tall fescue grass that we actually seeded after our biochar installation in the site. 34% was ground ivy plant, 12% was white clover plant species. These are the different plant species of turf grasses. Whereas in the amended section, we found like 80% was tall fescue that we actually stated in our biochar, uh, bi after the biochar installation, 7% was white clover, and also 30% was bare soil with no vegetation cover at all. So we no, believe that because of the presence of this ground ivy plant species that has a fibrous root system, that uh, group system and also in the amended section there was like 30 percent with, without any plant cover this call these two reasons combines in the unusual result of this case at during the summertime period so when we take a closer look of the spatial variation of cases for during this july 2020 measurement we see 
that in the unamended section, most of the region is greenish color, representing four to six centimeter per hour of PSA. Whereas for the biochar amended section, um, mostly it was like the right part was blue color with low case of less than two centimeter per hour. But as we move further close to the unamended section or more shaded region, we can also see that the case is increasing as of, of the unamended section with higher, uh, with case set of two centimeter per, high, uh, per hour. So this special variation kind of uh, supports our assumption, like as the amended section is receiving more sunlight uh, than this unamended section and the species was different. So that's why we, when the case set was like unusual and because of more vegetation cover and, diff and different plant species with fibrous root system, the amended section, unamended section has higher case set and also amend, uh, for the section for the portion closer to the unamended section in the biochar amended region also had higher case set compared to the the light portion uh, the uh, portion in the right side which was receiving more sunlight so uh, based on our case head measurement we tried to estimate the annual infiltration uh, annual increase in infiltration volume eventually annual reduction in runoff volume for which we used a couple overland flow infiltration model developed by Garcia Serena et al. in 2018. This model requires input parameters of soil saturated hydraulic conductivity. The case set that we measured for the last one year in this city test sites, weight of our treatment section, weight of the parking lot from which the site is receiving the uh, stormwater runoff and locations, rainfall frequency, and volume percentile curve. We generated the location-specific rainfall frequency curve from rainfall data of the in nearby weather station and uh, collected all the data from National Oceanic and Atmospheric Atmos Atmos Administration. And we used this rainfall frequency curve to calculate the annual increase in infiltrated volume and annual reduction in runoff ball stormwater volume. So based on the mod based on this modeling, we found like for the slag side, the effect of biochar in runoff reduction was much higher compared to the char side. So on average, we noticed like for, for different time period in September, November, and July, we can, we observed 60% to, to 24% of stormwater runoff reduction for our observed case head below in the slag side. Whereas for the chart side, except for the last set of measurements where we observed low case set in amended section, for the other two measurement type, we noticed like 13 to 61 percent of annual reduction in runoff volume. Here, I would like to mention like for the model that we applied for this estimation assumes 20 percent ground slope in built in their model, but uh, which is underestimate underestimating the actual in. Uh, increase in infiltration cause our charts both for our side, the slope is less than 10%, which means that the slope sides are more flat and it will have more, it will have more in, uh, infiltration. So this reduction in runoff volume, uh, we believe that in uh, actual, actual condition with, with more flat slope, the reduction in runoff volume was much higher compared to this resulting model value. So why we notice increased infiltration and reduction in runoff volume when we amend the biochar with soil. So when we add the soil, uh, the, we add biochar with the soil with this porous structure and high surface area, we believe that like with the, we hypothesize that it improves the soil structure. With, that means that the soil will have more water stable aggregates clumps together. And then this stable aggregates increases the interconnected pore network through which water can easily flow downwards. And then it results in increased hydraulic conductivity. So as after our last set of measurements, we collected soil cores from the field soil from, the, from our sampling points of KSET. And right now we are running experiments 
to answer this question, whether this increased hydraulic conductivity in the amended region can be uh, is due to this what increased water stable aggregates, and whether this water stable aggregates is actually increasing the interconnected pore system for which we are observing this increased hydraulic conductivity. To conclude, we added we derived voucher into typical uh, dominant soil in Tiber Hudson watch, watershed and observed the, uh, observed the field saturated hydraulic conductivity over one year of period. And we depending on, and we see as we see that the soil texture was different in two sites. So we observed that in the case, uh, the case site was two times on average, two times higher for the charge site and 7.3 times higher for the slag site, which has the slow mixture with gravel content. And also we tried to predict the annual reduction in stormwater runoff from a recently published model and found out like there was a annual reduction of 60% stormwater runoff from both of these sites. And we are also running, currently running experiments to investigate more into our hypothesized mechanism that when we add the biochar in soil, it increase, improves the soil structure, increases the soil aggregation, which was also, you know, which was also supported from our previous field study and preliminary data. And we are trying to investigate whether we see the similar mechanism here too. So to explain the effect of biochar addition in the case at enhanced enhancement. And also we are trying to run different uh, biochar soil combinations cause we see that depending on the soil texture, the effect of biochar in KSET, I mean, uh, KSET increase is also, uh, also differs. So we are also running, trying to run more uh, different, uh, more biochar soil combinations in laboratory for um, to see the beneficial effect of biochar amendment for different soil texture and also like more large scale field studies as well as laboratory studies are going on to explore more into this biochar, um, uh, biochar enhancement of soil hydraulic conductivity. Then uh, the next steps. Thank you, Srana. Which Daria will describe. Can you click that? Sarbon, can you click that? Mm -hmm. yeah. So for the next step, uh, we will working on developing a model to predict biochar induced change in saturated hydraulic conductivity uh, that will include biochar and in soil properties. So to do this, uh, as Sarbon mentioned that field tests at, at, at the other location in different soil types, types will be conducted to create the large input parameters for the model development. So uh, since it is important to see uh, the big picture of biochar benefit uh, to stormwater treatment system, so we propose um, to work that is shown the effect of biochar implementation in a large scale uh, watershed application. We propose to apply a SWAT model uh, to the areas that contribute to a high volume uh, of surface runoff and uh, see if it can be mitigated by incorporating biochar addition as well as uh, decreasing the nutrient loading to the water body. We plan on applying the case study uh, where we can create a biochar implementation scenario to select optimal locations by using soil uh, and water, soil and water assessment tool, which is called SWAT. Um, so before we start, uh, before we finish our presentation, uh, we want to conclude the acknowledgement part. Srabani, can you click that? Uh, acknowledgement part uh, that contributes uh, our work during uh, the testing or uh, installation of the biochar to the test site. Uh, our undergrad student and a grad student, Kunal, Reed, Eric, and Ali, thank you for, um, our your contribution, our research study, and also we would like to take uh, thank to Ted Wolf and his uh, team members in Howard EcoWorks. Now we want to follow up with the question and answer part. All right, awesome. Thank you, Daria and Straboni. We do have um, there was a couple questions in the Q and A. 
Daria, can you turn on your video and Sarboni? There was a couple questions in the Q&A mm -hmm. box that Dr. Imhoff answered. Uh, let me get the ones in the chat box and then I'll come back to those. Um, there was a question about how much biochar per area, which I think Dr. Imhoff answered, but maybe you can just re reiterate how much biochar you added per area. Strabonia or Duria. Dr. Amhoff, are you going to join us? <laughs> uh, <Okay>. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> okay. I'll, since uh, I guess I yeah. answered the. So they, they added 4% uh, by mass to the top uh, 12 inches of the soil. And since I saw another question related to this, we generally only add biochar to the top um, 12 inches because next to a impervious surface, that's the the most critical depth over which you can get the most significant increase in stormwater infiltration. You can certainly add it to deeper depths, but the based on our models, we don't anticipate the effect being uh, to warrant the additional costs. So we've only added it to 12 inches depth. Okay, very good. Um, Straboni, did you compare vegetation at the slack site in the way that you did at uh, the church site? Yes, uh, when I com like when, when I compared the slack site, the vegetation density was similar, and it was mostly the tall face crowgrass, only tall face crowgrass that we actually seeded in our installation period, and it was similar. Okay. Um, does the research estimate the percent void space after adding the biochar? Okay, Dr. Imhoff. <laughs> okay. Oh, turn on your mute, please. I mean, off your mute. So the answer is yes. You have to measure the bulk density of, of your, or predict the bulk density of your final mixture of soil and biochar. But if you know the, the, those bulk densities and you know the internal porosity of the biochar uh, with some measurements that we can make, then you, we can calculate what the pore volume is and, and both Strabone and Daria have done that. Okay, very good. Um, Dr. Imhoff, I think you already answered this. Um, is the goal to only amend to the typical root depth? Um, maybe just reiterate the answer to that. Uh, and the answer is generally yes. I say generally because Again, it seems like the, um, the top, top 12 inches are most important for increasing stormwater infiltration for most storms. The exception to that is some recent is at a couple of sites and we're not directly involved in, in the work um, where Infinite Solutions is evaluating injecting biochar much to deeper depths if there's a, a low permeability layer near the surface. And so that is a different idea, but only if you have something that's really constricting the flow near the surface. And so there are, that it is one, um, Infinite Solutions is examining that and they've just started to do that. We don't have any data on that yet. Okay. What nutrients are you concer concerned about? Nitrogen or phosphorus or both? And follow up, if dissolved phosphorus, we have found a biochar mineral combo works best, not just biochar only. Uh, yeah, actually, I also have several results that is combination for uh, nutrient, nu uh, nitrogen removal and phosphorus removal. But phosphorus uh, for the phosphorus removal mechanism is a bit um, uh, complicated since we also think the precipitation uh, changing in the pH. But mostly uh, the nitrogen is our goal, but uh, we will also conduct uh, the research to answer uh, the you know history of the phosphorus and what biochar can increase or decrease uh, the leaching from the soil or uh, what percentage what percentage can uh, reduce by biochar amendment. We are mostly interested in phosphorus and in plus nitrogen too. Okay. Um, let's see. What opportunities are there to develop local and regional sources of biochar versus importing from places like Oregon and Colorado? That seems important for scaling up. 
Are any of you aware of those types of opportunities? Yeah, maybe I can answer that. So this is a little bit out, this is outside of our focus area, but um, there are entities in our area. And I, when I say our area, I guess I'm thinking more of Pennsylvania where they do have a lot of wood harvesting and there are uh, lo so rel uh, local entities that are producing biochar. I don't know the volumes that they're producing. And there's certainly discussions about ramping up production of biochar if the market can warrant it. So it seems to be, it's a little bit of the uh, locally, the chicken and egg thing in terms of, um, is there enough of a market for people to invest in the equipment to make biochar for certain wood types? Mm -hmm. So that, that's my current understanding of, of, of the market. Um, others of you online actually may have more insight into that based upon your, your current work. But yes, certainly shipping um, biochar for our field studies from Oregon is not really environmentally sustainable. If you think about it, it's better to, to have lo local sources and that's what we would desire to. The reason that we selected that the sources is that they could, they were produced, they have had production capacity in to, to produce what we need in terms of large volumes. And also they've, they have had a track record of producing at very uniform paralysis conditions so we can trust the uniformity of the product. And also they provided us with enough um, information about their biochar that we were pretty sure it would give us the beneficial effects. Okay, great. Um, if anybody else wants to add uh, to an answer that question, like um, Paul Sturm or Chuck Hegberg in the chat, please feel free to offer your thoughts. Um, can biochar be created from raw sewage? Um. Answer could be yes, but the point, uh, I'm not sure if we have a like large pour volume because we live in the raw sewage, um, we'll include too many nutrient and phosphorus and nitrogen, and it might cause uh, leaching when we add the biochar. We may see the negative effect instead of uh, seeing the positive effect. It may be possible, but I'm not sure it could be considered as an amendment. Okay. With the plant effects and the variability in soils noted in the study, how reliable accounting for variability is the modeling and can this be separated from the tilling alone? It seems like the change over time greatly reduces the benefits of the biochar. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as, uh, as the soil actually has a like, lot of spatial variability, so we when we amend the biochar with soil, the K set also like has much of spatial variability. So when we compared our spatial variability to other published papers, we see that our coefficient of variation is in the range that people normally observe for the variability of saturated hydraulic conductivity. And then the plant effects, like we also notice the seasonal changes because with different seasons, like uh, with seasons for compared to the summer and winter and the growing season during the spring, the vegetation cover and plant actually differs varying with the season. So yeah, this plant also had a effect on this saturated hydraulic conductivity, which also differs with season. And then uh, for the modeling part that we applied or uh, developed for by the Garcia Serenital paper. So for there, we, uh, we use the geometric mean of saturated hydraulic conductivity that has been like, that is also recommended in the paper, uh, or in the paper that we use for our modeling. So we use the geometric mean saturated hydraulic conductivity for all of these test sections. And maybe yeah. I can just add one more comment. So the, okay. for one of the sites, the Slack Funeral Home, certainly there's a, a temporal change in the performance. And that's uh, normal when you're, uh, as I understand it, when you're dealing with near surface soils, the, because of plant growth and changes in, in um, plant structure that occur through seasons, you're gonna see changes in infiltration. So that, that those, those temporal changes were normal. The last measurement at the Slack site was actually at the highest one in terms of uh, infiltration, as I remember. So the um, so it's not like things are getting worse with time. Also, although certainly you would expect things to get more compacted with time, 
but we haven't seen a general decrease in performance with time. We haven't really observed that, that we, we say, yeah, it's not working as time progresses. That hasn't been the case. It's been more seasonal variations. And yeah, so I, anyway, I think that was the last thing I wanted to comment on that question. Okay, great. Do you recommend biochar for agricultural applications like crop production where active growth and soil movement is reoccurring? Uh, yes, uh, it's definitely recommended. I mean, as I said, we can use a biochar from the different feedstock and some biochar can also be used as a fertilizer. And the benefit of using biochar as a fertilizer, as we said, we're not gonna get too much uh, phosphorus or nutrient leaching happen to the uh, water body. But uh, biochar will, by itself, will pro, uh, will product uh, the nutrient for the grant, uh, grant uh, for the plant growth or crop vegetation, crop uh, growth. So it also, I mean, many studies has shown that uh, biochar, particularly uh, the manure biochar from the animal waste, uh, has included a lot of nutrient available for the plant, and it's also uh, available for the plant uptake. Instead of using fertilization, uh, nowadays people are uh, tend to see biochar as a fertilizer instead of using the chemical fertilizer. I mean, using biochar is kind of uh, providing uh, the natural fertilizer and you know, and increasing the nutrient available for plant uptake. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is similar. Um, is the use of biochar practical for residential use? Uh, residential use means um, like like on lawns, I guess, or in a on a home scale. I mean, as a as an amendment, yes. Uh, for example, in Ellicott City, people also uh, using a biochar in their uh, small rain garden to uh, increase uh, their water uh, retention and also increase the infiltration capacity. Uh, if you can add in the topsoil, which we did in 12 inches, so it's easy. You can just, uh, you know, mix it with the shovel and in a bucket. It would be perfect using for uh, your rain garden to make it better. Yay. <laughs> um, do you have an estimate of what 4% biochar by mass equated to and percent bio biochar by volume for your sites? Uh, yes, um, actually, uh, the biochar we use, uh, the estimate we use four percent by mass, which is equal to about uh, eight per uh, nine percent, nine to uh, ten to twelve percent by volume. Okay. Yeah. If you can't do a bulk density test and want to improve infiltration using biochar, what is a field method that is easy to use to determine how much biochar is appropriate for your site? I can answer that. So the uh, appropriate for your site, I assuming for infiltrating stormwater. And the answer is, uh, we don't know that. We do have models to predict if you want to increase <clears throat> the, the porosity or the water retention of your soil, how much biochar to add. And your, the comment was, well, what if you don't know the bulk density? We have ways of kind of estimating that based upon the amount of biochar you add roughly. It's not a perfect number. So we do have ways of estimating if you want to increase the porosity or the water retention capacity of your soil, we have um, uh, models, a model that we recently developed for doing that. What we don't have is any models that produce, that are able to predict this, this time dependent effect of, of soil aggregation, which seems to be the dominant mechanism for causing the infiltration. So right now, um, we don't have a way of predicting how much biochar to add if you want a certain percent reduction in stormwater runoff or a certain increase in infiltration rate. Uh, and that's why we're continuing with, with some more field work. Okay. Could biochar be mixed with rain garden soil? And Durya already answered that. And yes, it can be. Uh, I also am looking at the bio, uh, rain garden. Uh, we call it the soil mix mixture. And I added uh, the 4% biochar and then 2% biochar on my bioretention media uh, for the North Carolina bioretention media, which is mostly sandy soil. And with the Delaware uh, biotension matter, which is more include compost and mulch. So yes, you can 
uh, the biochar to increase uh, the water retention and also plus increase the infiltration rate. Since uh, the water retention is really, uh, uh, I mean, the retention time, res resistance uh, time in and the water retention media is really uh, small. So nutrient, unfortunately, nutrient uh, uh, removal sometimes is not effective. So with the adding biochar, we will increase the water retention uh, time and also increase the nutrient loading at the same time. Okay, Jaria, this is a follow-up to that same thought um, about the next step in this research. And um, the uh, question was, I'd be interested to see if there is a study on the impact of biochar being used as a soil retrofit in undersized bioretention facilities. Um, um, I think answer is yes. Um, actually, we, we were planning to add a biochar in an infiltration basin, which is really uh, in the large scale infiltration basin to increase uh, the infiltration rate. Since we also seeing many times the compaction and then we, since when, we when the compaction increase, for sure, uh, the infiltration rate, rate decrease. When we add a biochar, we increase the bulk density. It also includes the pore structure, develop the large pore volume, and also uh, with the less compaction. I mean, our uh, further study also uh, connected to seeing the biochar effect on compaction. And for the retrofit, um, I think uh, Dr. Mo can answer the pullover part because uh, in the DALDOT part, we were, we were uh, adding the biochar in some uh, infiltration basin to, and some problem, there, there, there was some problematic infiltration basin and we were adding biochar to uh, look at this change and an increase uh, and then solve this problem, what's happening there. Yeah, so just a comment. So in terms of the, uh, our work on bioretention systems, so we don't have any field work on bioretention systems. Yeah. And what Daria was referring to is a system that we thought we might end up doing biochar amendment on, but they, the, they, the funding agency ran out of funds, so we didn't do the field test. Uh, what we have done are laboratory tests with bioretention media from Delaware and North Carolina, and, and Daria has done that, and the effect on plant growth in bioretention media in those systems, especially if they undergo periods of drought. And I would say generally that the results were very, very positive in terms of the biochar um, increasing stormwater infiltration, at the same time increasing stormwater retention, which seems counterintuitive, and also uh, allowing the plants to thrive better. The only negative was if the bioretention meeting had a lot of compost in it, the, um, th this particular wood-based biochar uh, changed the water chemistry and allowed uh, increased phosphorus release from the compost. And that was unexpected. And that's something that we're still trying to understand. And that gets to just a comment that sometimes you can get unexpected effects because of, um, you know, when you add something like a biochar, you are changing pH and maybe um, sorption sites and the water chemistry in the system. So depending what pollutant you're looking at, looking at it may be somewhat of a negative. Um, so in this case, for, in the Delaware media that had this high percentage of compost for the bioretention system, it resulted in phosphorus release, greater release of phosphorus. In the North Carolina media that had no compost in it, but um, the carbon source was sawdust, there was no detrimental effect uh, on phosphorus. So there can be interactions with other um, compounds in the system. But for adding for that, yeah, we see... Uh the maybe increased concentration of phosphorus since we are changing the mechanism and particularly pH. But for the nitrogen, it's still so promising. We saw definitely high uh, nitrogen removal, total dissolved nitrogen removal in, in the two uh, system. It, it either includes uh, mulch or uh, not only sandy. And also, uh, it also helps to uh, leach less nutrient from the system to the groundwater. Okay. Uh, we only have one more minute left, but I would like to try to get through the questions if possible. Is that okay with you guys? If, if, the, if uh, attendees need to drop off, um, this is recorded and you can come back and revisit the questions. Um, do you have a few extra minutes, Durya and Sarboni and Dr. Imhoff? Okay. 
Um, there's a couple comments about um, making uh, biochar from poultry litter on the eastern shore of Maryland. Perhaps you could just uh, maybe in brief talk to speak to that or the differences between uh, wood-based biochar and poultry biochar. Um, I mean, uh, for my work, actually we just work on the wood-based biochar, but our for, uh, former graduate student of Dr. Imhoff uh, was uh, conducted, the re conducted research uh, looking at the po poultry litter and the wood uh, biochar, effect on poultry litter and wood, uh, wood biochar. And poultry litter doesn't have too much uh, surface area and also pore structure is completely different. Mm -hmm. If you want to use uh, the poultry litter for the infiltration, it's not gonna work. But wood biochar has large pore volumes, which increase uh, the water retention. That's why we conduct all uh, stormwater management uh, study using the wood-based biochar. But uh, regarding uh, the pore structure, um, poultry litter has uh, enrich uh, the nutrient. It can be used for fertilizer for particular agricultural application. Okay, great, thank you. In mercury research, there's some evidence that biochar blended with soil compared to a distinct biochar layer in the profile reduces adsorption because some of the reactive sites get binded. Could this same dynamic be at play with water retention? Uh, you know, I can answer that. I don't think so. Um, uh, at least we haven't seen it when we've mixed our biochars with a range of different soils. So in the laboratory, we're using uh, a whole range of different soils that we're mixing the, the couple of biochars we've been testing, and we have not seen any unexpected results on water retention because of different materials present in the soil, okay. like mercury or other metals. Okay, great. How does the specifications of the Oregon biochar used compare to the IBI biochar standards? Maybe I should answer that and I will have to defer. So I don't know the standards well enough to know. So um, I, I, I wish I could answer that question, but I can't. <laughs> okay. No problem. Can you illuminate on how the results might change based on the vary on varying the biochar properties, such as feedstock and pyrolysis. I noticed you used the high temperature pyrolysis and ponderous a pine source. How might this change with other sources and temperature? Yeah, I, I can answer that. Like as Daria also mentioned, like depending on the previous stroke, like as for proliterator biochar, it has like lower pores, pore structure and low surface area. So this might not be it might, would not be helpful for the water retention to hold water in the porous structure of biochar. But when we use the wood-based biochar, it has like higher porosity and high surface specific surface area. In the, so that's why we found like wood based biochar is much beneficial for the folding the water in is in its pore structure and increasing the water retention. And in terms of pyrolysis condition, is uh, we you know, we have like from in our lab we have used two different types of biochar. One is pyrolyzed at 550 degrees centigrade, and this this Oregon biochar was pyrolyzed at 950 degrees centigrade. So the difference was like when we are you know, using higher temperature, then the biochar is to ha ha will have more porous structure and high higher surface specific service area and also more aromatic functional groups there compared to the biochar that was produced in lower temperature. So it, depending on the sources and feed stroke, they are, the biochar uh, structure and properties actually varies mostly on the pore structure, specific surface area and the functional groups if we want to take a look on the nutrient removal or any other pollutant removal characteristics. Uh, and also ash content uh, also changing depending uh, and also related to the carbon content mm -hmm. and sequestration also changing depending on uh, the temperature. Okay, great. If I could uh, just jump in one mm -hmm. question I didn't answer, uh, Chuck Hegberg answered for me. Yes, this Oregon biochar does meet IBI standards. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. good. Thank goodness. 
Um, in general, which area type do you suspect will need biochar the most, like near highways or some other location? Um, <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, we are trying to use biochar to everywhere. <laughs> if you want to, uh, for sure, increase the infiltration rate, which is necessary, so we can use it everywhere. But since we are using is it so storm stormwater uh, management practices, we prefer to use in uh, like a green infrastructure as a soil amendment or uh, the soil mixture amendment to increase the infiltration rates. We prefer, in, in a large scale, uh, we prefer using a green base uh, to, restore, uh, to reduce the volume runoff from uh, the highway and also it increase uh, the heavy metal uh, loading, concentration loading to the groundwater as well. So. Yeah. I would like to add one more comment, like mostly like if I if we like to add the biochar to for the what stormwater runoff reduction. So if we make the biochar uh, treatment section parallel to the like the connect connectors, like from the impervious areas to the pervious area, like the greenways from the highways. So the more we are closer to the connecting area of impervious area to pervious area, and then we if we apply uh, more the if I apply the biochar treatment section as if that the length is much higher is parallel to the impervious areas and then width can be width can be limited to six feet or ten feet and we believe that applying biochar in that way cover, covering mostly the connecting areas the, the intermediate connecting areas from impervious to pervious would be more beneficial for large scale application okay great um thank you to chuck pegberg for answer or providing some comments in the chat uh, here's a question. What about impacts to soil structure and soil biota from tilling? Seems like preference generally is to move away from tilling whenever possible. Is there a better way to amend with biochar and leave structure more intact? And I can answer that a little bit. I think the, I agree that tilling is a short term and generally if it's not done correctly, you couldn't you know, lead to suspended solids and, and uh, increased in runoff. Um, so we've, we've done it because we wanted a uniform application in the top 12 uh, inches. Uh, Infinite Solutions is doing evaluation, injecting biochar to deeper depths with a different uh, way, basically of uh, um, breaking up the soil by uh, injecting air in it and then pushing um, biochar basically in holes. So that, that's the technology. So that's a different technology. It would not be as disruptive as tilling. In the long run, I think what we're hoping is that the, the, the effects of tilling will, in terms of breaking up the, the soil and creating bigger pores, that will diminish with time no matter what. But the idea is that biochar, when it's in, once it's in the soil, will change the soil microbiology, will increase the soil aggregation, and will have some long-term beneficial effects on soil structure. That, that's the hope. Okay, excellent. Well, we've made it through all the questions and um, we appreciate the uh, panelists spending some extra time with us today. Thank you to everybody for attending our presentation. Um, again, this will be posted on our website if you wanna check it out later or share it with your colleagues. And thank you to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation for supporting our work and to the University of Delaware for providing us with this excellent research that we hope will continue into the future. So, thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, Daria Cerboni and Dr. Inman. Thank you, Lori, for leading this discussion. Yeah, great, great questions for everybody, good answers. Yeah, we're delighted to join you. Thank you for yeah. organizing it. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks, Paul. See you later. Can we leave, Lori, right now? Yeah, you can leave. Okay. <laughs> Have a good day.